Hi, this is Pastor Daryl Myatt from Keller, Texas. Today is Friday, June 30th, 2017. This channel is all about world news, Bible prophecy, end time events, and the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Last day of June. Wow, this year is flying by, isn't it? Half over now. Uh, anyway, let's have a look at a few things going on today out of Fox News. Military option for North Korea being prepared for Trump, says McMaster. Military option for North Korea. The Trump administration is considering a wider range of strategies on how to deal with North Korea, including the military option. Trump's national security advisor said, <clears throat> the threat is much more immediate now, and so it's clear that we can't repeat the same approach, the same failed approach of the past, said H.R. McMaster, the advisor, during a security count, uh, conference with Homeland Security Chief John Kelly. He said it would be insanity to continue to do the same thing the U.S. has done for years and expect a different result. Military option. North Korea. You know, North Korea has a nuclear program. They've been shooting off intercontinental ballistic missiles, testing them. They've done several nuclear tests. It's believed they have nuclear weapons capable of reaching mainland USA. Hmm. Military option being considered. All right. Let's hope and pray. Um, <clears throat> out of Ynet News, Russia says it will respond with dignity if the U.S. mounts a Syria strike. What's a dignified military response? I'm just curious. I've never heard that one. Russia said they would respond with dignity and proportionality if the United States takes preemptive measures against Syrian government forces to stop what Washington says could be a planned chemical attack. Responding with dignity. <clears throat> okay. What does that mean? I I'm not sure I know what that means. Um, I guess we'll find out. Out of the Times of Israel, Reuven Rivlin says government must prioritize unity of the Jewish people. They're trying to unitize the Jewish people in Israel. President Reuven Rivlin said the he urged the government to prioritize the unity of the Jewish people and retain its role as the state for all Jews following a fallout from recent cabinet decision freezing a deal to establish a permanent pluralistic prayer section at the Western Wall. Wow, that was a tongue twister. Unitizing the Jewish people. What do you suppose could unify all the Jewish people? Oh, I don't know, something like building the third Jewish temple on the Temple Mount? Hmm. Hopefully soon. Here's an interesting story that comes out of Israel, out of breaking Israel news. It says, new Saudi royal appointment appears to correspond with Bible prophecy. With Bible prophecy. You know, in Saudi Arabia, they replaced uh, one crown prince with another, dividing the fragmented world of Islam even further, increasing the tensions between Sunni Islam and Shia Islam. The shifting reality in the Middle East has political analysts in a quandary, but this very development was predicted explicitly in an ancient Jewish source, and one rabbi, who's an expert in end-of-days prophecy, explained that this global shift in politics is returning the world to a more biblical framework. Interesting. Um, I'm not going to read all of this story, but it's interesting to me that this Bible prophecy story comes out of Israel, comes from a rabbi in Israel talking about Saudi Arabia. And while I find it very amazing that these kind of things are happening, I'm actually happy that Israel is recognizing these things too. Um, here's what Rabbi Yitzhak said, uh, speaking about the book of Isaiah. He said, in the year in which the Messiah King appears, all the nations of the world are provoking each other. The King of Persia, which is Iran, provokes an Arab King, and the Arab King turns to Aram for advice. And the King of Persia, Iran, goes back and destroys the entire world, and all the nations of the world are in panic 
and distress, and they fall upon their faces and are seized with pains like those of a woman giving birth. And Israel are in panic and distress, asking, Where shall we go? Where shall we go? And he says to them, My sons, do not fear. All that I have done, I have done only for you. Why are you afraid? Do not fear. Your time of redemption has come, and the final redemption is not like the first redemption, because the first redemption was followed by sorrow and servitude under other kingdoms, but the final redemption is not followed by sorrow and servitude under other kingdoms. Very cool. Um, I like when Bible prophecy quotes come from Israel. I mean, because, let's face it, first of all, they don't, most of them don't believe the New Testament anyway. Of course, there is a lot of Bible prophecy in the Old Testament that has not yet happened. But I love to see this. You know, they're still looking for the Messiah that we already know. He came once the first time, died on a cross to save everybody who believes in him, who calls upon his name. And he's coming back again. He said so. I'm pretty sure this time the Jews will recognize the Messiah. But it's the same one who came some 2,000 years ago. They missed it somehow. Um, out of Ynet News. <clears throat> Khomeini's representative says Islamic State's Baghdadi is definitely dead. Islamic State leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi is definitely dead, said Iran's state news agency. Quoting a representative of Iran Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khomeini as saying on Thursday, terrorist Baghdadi is definitely dead. Russia's been telling us this for a couple of months now. Now, Iran is telling us the same thing. Now, before you start thinking, oh, the caliphate's over, the ISIS thing is a thing of the past, understand this, when one falls, there's a hundred thousand or more willing to step up and take his place. So it's bound to happen. Uh, out of the Jerusalem Post, Hamas and PFLP partners to speak at a UN event marking 50 years of occupation. Organizations that partner with Hamas and the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine will participate in the United Nations Forum to mark 50 years of occupation, which will be held at the UN headquarters Thursday and Friday, today. 50 years of occupation. That's what they call it, because Israel liberated Jerusalem 50 years ago. <laughs> you know, didn't Jesus tell us to occupy until I come? Anyway, I mean... But they're not occupying the land. They're living in the land that God gave them. You see, there's a big difference. When people claim that Israel is occupying the land, they're basically saying they're there illegally and that they're not supposed to be there. I mean, you might as well say that America is occupying the land that belongs to the natives. I mean... That's a much truer statement than actually saying Israel's is occupying the land. But no one seems to care about that. Um, Israel is exactly where they're supposed to be. Israel and Jerusalem are the very same Israel and Jerusalem spoken of in the Bible. There's so many people that say, oh, the Israel of today is not the Israel of the Bible. Yeah, it is. Jerusalem's in the same place it was right here in Scripture. The Temple Mount is the same place it was when King David built it, spoken of right here in Scripture. Mount Zion is the same place it's been since Jesus stood there and said, you see these buildings, this building down here? Not one stone will remain upon another. The Olivet Discourse, uh, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, was all spoken from Mount Zion, overlooking the Temple Mount. Same place today as it was then. Times have changed. Things are a little bit different. We now have cars and internet and cell phones. But it's the same place. Christ will return to Mount Zion. He will rule and reign from Jerusalem for a thousand years when he returns. Same place. Out of Prophecy News Watch. It says Christians have no place in government. No Christians allowed. Protest and outrage from the gender radical left are once again the tactic to silence and exclude Christian voices. 
At issue is the invitation made by the Department of Education for prominent Christians from the Family Research Council and Focus on the Family to speak at a conference on the active and engaged role of fathers in their children's lives. <clears throat> the pro-LGBT groups Human Rights Campaign and GLAAD, G-L-A-A-D, which I don't really know what that stands for, um, both assert that the inclusion of Christian voices, despite being well-respected and nationally renowned experts on family values, is an affront to their agenda for diverse families. The whole gay issue seems to want to silence Christians who say, uh, yeah, that's a sin. That's an abomination to God. They want to go by their own opinions instead of what God's Word says. Well, of course, because if you go by God's Word, then they have to face the fact that they're sinners in need of a Savior. So, you can wish that there were no Christians speaking out against your godless agenda, but guess what? There's Christians speaking out against your godless, sinful agenda. So, that's the way it's going to be until Christ returns. Um, that's the way it is. Sorry. Out of Christian headlines, th this has to be one of the most ignorant and unthought out comments I think I've ever heard. And who does it come from? <laughs> None other than that great theologian, Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi says Republicans' efforts to defund Planned Parenthood dishonor God. <laughs> well, now, isn't that special, hmm? Um, she says Republicans' efforts to defund Planned Parenthood dishonor God. I'm sorry, Nancy Pelosi, you don't know God. You don't know the true God. Now, maybe it dishonors the God that you serve because you like to sacrifice these unborn children to the God that you serve. It's not going to do you any good, I can tell you that. House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi recently criticized Republicans' efforts to defund Planned Parenthood, even going so far as to say that these kind of efforts dishonor God. So, condemning murder of unborn babies dishonors God somehow? Who said, thou shalt not kill? I think you got it a little backwards, Nancy. But then again, it seems like you get everything a little backwards. This is the kind of sad commentary that we see today. People who have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. Wait a minute, where have I read that before? Um, this is exactly the kind of thing that will happen at the times of the end. And we've been told this in Scripture. If you go to... 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. This know also in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. From such turn away. She's trying to tell people, oh, trying to stop abortion dishonors God. I'm sorry, Nancy. You are so lost and so far from real truth. You have no idea. Did any of you know that today, June 30th, is Asteroid Day? Asteroid Day. Didn't know? You can watch NASA TV telling about how they, they find uh, and track and, and, and uh, put into categories all these near-Earth objects. Neo. Hmm. Makes you wonder what the Matrix was on to when they had their name, main character named Neo. Near-Earth object. Um, there's, you can also see videos showing tourists in, in uh, some shallow water in Florida at a beach 
that's been seen some five and a half million times now, not because of the tourists, but because of the sharks that are swimming around them at the time of the filming. Or there's, um, maybe you heard about this YouTube couple who wanted to become famous, so they came up with this stunt to where the girl was going to shoot the guy's chest, but he was going to have a book in front of it, hoping it would stop the bullet, and then they would be famous and get rich and everyone would know who they were. But the bullet went right through the book, killed the guy, and the girlfriend's been charged with manslaughter. They used a 50 caliber pistol. It's like, why would you use a 50 caliber pistol? Maybe a 22 might have been a better idea, but then there's a story of the baby that was born on Spirit Airlines. Born in the air, traveling from like Fort Lauderdale to Dallas. And the airline has given this baby free airfare for life. Really? Go oh, anywhere you want to go. Of course, that's if Spirit Airlines remains in business. Yeah, that's another thing. Um, now you're probably saying, uh, Daryl, I'm sorry, what do these stories have to do with Bible prophecy or real news at all? Well, here's the point. They've got nothing to do with Bible prophecy. I mean, your odds of dying from a, an asteroid or a meteor hitting you are like one in one and a half million. You're 17,000 times more likely to die in a car wreck. <clears throat> Sharks aren't likely to kill you either. I mean, falling coconuts have killed 15 times more people than sharks every year. Falling coconuts. Now, you're probably not wanting to go fire a gun into your chest either with a book on your chest. Uh, and, and I don't know the kind of statistics there are on babies born on airplanes since it doesn't happen that much. <clears throat> Here's what I'm getting at, though. Most of the news that you usually care about is directly proportional to its relevance in your life. You ever think about that? You know, since we have social media, we've got instant news, daily digital news sources, <clears throat> we can limit what we see to only the things we like to see. You know, if a topic or a subject's not relevant to us, then it's really not relevant at all, is it? Hmm. You know, that's... I guess that's one way to look at the constant bombardment of information that we get today. You know, all the emails, the internet, the Facebook, the YouTube, the LinkedIn, the Instagram, whatever social media overflow that we have. <clears throat> Seems like the urgent is hardly ever significant, and the significant is hardly ever urgent. When asked about the return of Christ, I heard one person respond with, That day is no horror to me, for thy death has redeemed me, thy spirit fills me, thy love animates me, thy word govern, governs me. This person knew that thou wilt come to raise my body from the dust and reunite it to my soul, by a wonderful work of infinite power and love, greater than that which bounds the oceans, waters, ebbs, and flows the tides, keeps the stars in their course, and gives life to all creatures. As a result, I triumph now in thy promise as I do in their performance. You know, if you think about it, nothing seems less relevant to this secular, godless culture we live in than preparing for eternity. Most of them are like, whatever, I'm living today. But on the day that we die and we go see Jesus or he comes to see us, whichever is more important or whichever happens first, nothing will be more relevant for everyone in that moment. I think being ready for that day is the best way to live each and every day. But there's hardly any people that think it's relevant for us to prepare for eternity now. Right? They think, oh, you know, I'm going to live for today. I'm not going to worry about that. That's probably, you know, some people think, oh, we're just like roadkill. You know, once we die, we're dead. We're dust. We're nothing. We're gone. 
No thought, no nothing. End of story, over. Nothing could be further from the truth. Jesus himself spoke many times of everlasting life, of the fact that when we die here, it's just the beginning of eternity. He told parable after parable that explains and confirms the truth of your spirit living forever. And there's only two, destination, two destinations for your spirit, either heaven or hell. And the difference is if you accepted Christ as Lord and Savior or not. If you rejected him, you're going to be rejected when you stand before God. Cast into the bottomless pit. He'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. So what if your last day was today? Hmm. You know, none of us are promised tomorrow. None of us. Our time could come anytime. That's why it's so important you know Jesus is Lord and Savior. Let's go to Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, verse 9. <clears throat> In Ephesians 1, verse 9, it says, Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. You know, as humans, we're always wanting to know why. And why not now? Uh, but that's exactly why we don't know. It's because we're human. You know, God says, My thoughts and ways are so far and above you, you can't possibly understand. That's why mystery it's so important to understand. I mean, the whole book of Job is all about the why of suffering. And in the end, God invites Job to see the bigger picture than even his suffering, right? I mean, creation is a mistake is all, if, if all you ever see is suffering. That's not all there is. You know, if you look and open your eyes a little further and you look over all of the entire universe that God's created, you can see that creation has abundant beauty and grace and amazing things. So we should value mystery because it enables us to feel God's love, love that was fully revealed in his son, Jesus Christ. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know, sometimes we get to see the why or the why not now, you know, which is something that probably comes with getting a little older and wiser. You know, a lot of times we don't see that because we're the players in the life of this universe. We're not the director. We're not the playwright. <laughs> um, so it's very interesting to keep your eyes on Christ. Look on the big picture. God is always greater than our understanding of him. And there will always be mystery about him that causes us to be in awe of him. This mystery, which we want to kind of put in a box and keep in categories, keeps causing struggles in our lives. Hmm. We're not called to solve the mystery. We're called to enter it and to trust him with everything in our lives. Everything. In Romans 9, verse 3, it says, For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. You know, I'm sure, like me, you have someone in your life who doesn't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Maybe you have several. How do you plan on sharing the gospel with these people? You know, Matthew, one of Jesus' disciples, um, I think he had a pretty simple plan. He was a he was a tax collector, a former tax collector, I should say, who wanted some of his old friends to meet Jesus. So what did he do? He threw a party. <laughs> Great idea. They met Jesus, and he changed their lives. Good idea, Matthew. The Apostle Paul took an even bolder approach. He was willing to do anything to save his fellow Jews from hell. Willing to do anything. Right here in Romans 9, verse 3, he seemed to be willing to trade places with them in eternity. Now, there's a lot of people on this planet that I love. I 
am not so sure that I could say that I would be willing to trade places with them in hell for all of eternity so that they may taste everlasting life. I'm not sure I could say, yes, I'll do that for somebody. I mean, that's, that's love. That's, that's a commitment. That's compassion. I don't think your plan or my plan has to go that far. You know, God's just asking you to be willing to introduce Jesus to other people. Then God will do the rest. You know, we plant the seed. God nurtures it. He waters it. He makes it grow. Right? God is looking for people like you and me. And the only requirement is to love and care for others. I think the greatest ability is to be available. So make yourself willing. Make yourself able, make yourself available to take part in your plan to introduce other people to Jesus Christ. Think about how you might share your testimony with somebody, how you might lead someone to the only one who could save them. You know, God has a purpose for the storms in our life. In, in Psalm 119, uh, verse 71, actually, you know, Psalm 119, a little Bible trivia for you. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible, okay? Psalm 119. What's the shortest? Psalm 117. And in between the shortest chapter and the longest chapter in the Holy Bible is the center chapter, Psalm 118. There's 594 chapters before Psalm 118, and there's 594 chapters after Psalm 118. So Psalm 118 is the very center of the Bible, the very heart. And the very center verse of God's scripture, the, the verse that's at the very heart of God's word, I think very near to his heart, is Psalm 118 verse 8, which says, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. God wants us to trust him, not other people. Um... But in Psalm 119, verse 71, it says, It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. It's good for me that I've been afflicted. You know, maybe you've seen a, a TV show where uh, there's a distracted person that's about to step in front of a, a moving car or truck or something. And then suddenly some other character just bursts onto the scene and tackles them to prevent you know, the inevitable. And then, you know, somewhat stunned and maybe even indignant, the, the victim fumes and, and screams at their rescuer, you know, until they realize they've just been saved from death, probably. What at first seemed like a bad thing turned out to be very good, right? Same with these storms in our life. They can serve a similar purpose. You know, it's easy to get so caught up in our, our daily grind of, work and everything else that comes with it, or we're preoccupied with chasing a goal that we, we miss the good that God has in mind for us. When we're this focused on our own desires, we also become more vulnerable to making choices that don't line up with what God's Word says or what God's will is. But, you know, wanting the best for His children, our Heavenly Father will go to, I think, great lengths to make sure we're positioned for His blessing in our life, right? That's when we might suddenly find ourselves in the middle of a storm. You know, where everything was once sunny, we're now faced with pain or trouble or distress. You know, disappointment can catch us off guard and make us wonder, why is God letting this happen to me? What did I do? Why is God mad at me? It might just be that he's trying to protect us and draw us nearer to him. You know, God does sometimes allow these storms in our life in the form of problems or trials or tribulation or hardship. His goal is not to hurt you. So if you're going through a trial right now, God might be trying to draw your attention back to Him and off what you've had your attention on for quite some time now. And maybe it's possible He's disrupting your plans so He can start implementing his plan. You ever think about that? Um, let's go to 1 Thessalonians. 
1 Thessalonians 5, verse 24. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 24. It says, Faithful is he that calls you, who also will do it. Faithful is he that calls you. You ever felt discouraged about trying to live life as a Christian? I mean, if your efforts to make a difference in the world seem fruitless, then maybe following after our Lord's outlook might change your opinion. Uh, Christ served others in love. His, his actions had a great impact on the world. How was Jesus so effective? I mean, Scripture tells us Jesus didn't speak or act on his own. Uh, but instead depended on his father, aiding him to do the work. John 14, verse 10. I think we need to do the same thing. Or so often we attempt to serve out of our own skills, out of our own abilities, our own intelligence, our own reason, our own logic, if you will. Even though we might pour great effort and long hours into ministry, these alone won't produce any fruit. It's far more important to minister as God intends. You know, true service is commissioned, it's, it's empowered, and it's blessed by God alone. It might be our hands that are doing the work, but our Father is the one behind the work. And the glory doesn't belong to us, it belongs to Him. You see, I think a lot of people kind of have it wrong. A lot of people are trying to get famous telling others about Jesus I'm just trying to make Jesus famous. I, I went down the road of you know seeking my own glory. I've been there, done that. And it probably took that to get me to where I am today. That should bring us great comfort. Um, God's not looking for people who are extremely talented. I think he'll use everyone who's willing to let his spirit work through them. I think he's willing to use anyone who says, here am I, Lord, use me. And we can be confident that he will provide everything we need in order to do whatever he asks, whatever his will is for our lives. I mean, who among us can serve the living God? I mean, honestly, none of us are qualified. None of us are able to serve the living God. I think real service occurs only when we allow God Almighty to pour himself through us, because we're simply vessels through which his light shines, through which his power flows. You know, even if the impact isn't obvious to us, we know that God always achieves his purpose. And what's more, he's glorified in the process. Have you noticed how much opposition there is to the gospel of God? Matthew 10, 34, Jesus said, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. How about what Luke says? In Luke 12, is it Luke 12? Luke 12, verse 51. Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth, I tell you no, but rather division. Hmm. You know, a lot of people think these kind of statements are some kind of contradiction to prophecies talking about Jesus and some of Jesus' own statements concerning peace, as well as what was written of about him in the New Testament. But the peace that Jesus purchased was peace between God and man. I mean, we have peace with God, Romans 5, verse 1. We're exhorted to take this peace and extend it to all men, but it's made very clear that not all men will receive it. What's the division that Jesus brings? You can read in Matthew 25 where Jesus is separating the goats from the sheep. You know, the sheep at his right hand, the goats at his left. The sheep go to heaven, the goats go to hell. There is division Jesus brings. You either believe him or you don't. There's really no middle ground. There's no gray area. There's no sitting on the fence. You either believe Christ is who he is or you don't. Peace can only come when we relate to God on the basis of faith in what he did for us instead of what we do for him. You know, a person who thinks that he has to perform or do some kind of work to be accepted by God will never have peace because you can never do enough to have peace with God. That puts the burden of salvation on our shoulders and we can't bear that heavy load. There's no way. We're incapable of living holy enough to please God before we were saved and we're incapable of living holy enough to please God now that we are saved. 
Hebrews 11, verse 6, we were saved by faith. And we have to continue to walk with God by faith. Colossians 2, verse 6, I think not understanding this has made a lot of Christians who love God unable to enjoy the peace that was provided for them through faith in Jesus Christ. You know, the gospel is always going to produce some kind of opposition from those who don't receive it, from those who reject it. This sort of division, even among family members, is not God's will, and it's not God that causes it. It will inevitably come, though, and Jesus was simply preparing his disciples for that time. And as much as we would like everyone to receive the good news of Jesus Christ, we must not think it strange when even our loved ones and close friends don't receive it. I mean, Jesus was rejected by his own. Guess what? We will be too if we serve him. We have to remain faithful to continue preaching the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ because there are others who will receive it. So keep sharing the good news no matter what kind of opposition you come up against. You know, if I stopped this ministry the first time somebody mocked me or made fun of me or called me names or ridiculed me or threatened me, I would have stopped about the second day I started. Okay, it happens. I thank God that he has made me the bold person I am. I'm not afraid to stand up and tell a room full of Muslims about Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. I'm not afraid to shout Jesus Christ from the rooftops. And he's really helped me to not take it personally when they tell me how ridiculous I am or some of the names that I get called, I actually count it all good when I hear these kind of things, and I know that I must be doing something right. When the devil's coming up against you because of what you're doing and how you're serving, that's always a good thing. Because if the devil's not coming up against you, chances are you're running with him. Just saying. Anyway, listen, you guys have a great weekend. Go worship our Lord and Savior somewhere. Next week might be a little tricky for me. Uh, of course, there's 4th of July. There's my youngest son's birthday. There's my wife's 50th birthday. Uh, a lot of things going on. My fourth child, Malik, is coming back for a few weeks over the weekend, so he'll He'll show up on Sunday, I think. What's today? Friday? Uh, and he'll be here for a couple of weeks or slightly longer. So I've got a very busier schedule next week. A lot of things going on. Of course, later on in July is also my 28th wedding anniversary. <laughs> so <laughs> trying to plan a lot of things, a lot of events, uh, hopefully some travel coming up. So, not sure what my message schedule will look like next week, but good Lord willing, I'll see you again on Monday. Love you guys. Have a great weekend.